hands together to Mark's gospel in as much as we, uh, we've mentioned that we're celebrating our, our anniversary, 41 years. I shared just a couple of things, but I didn't create a, uh, um, a special message of any sort for that. Um, I'm going to continue just teaching through Mark as I normally do, but I will say this, that when our, uh, our church first began and we had our very first uh, Bible study, the very first Sunday morning, uh, July 26, 1981, I taught out of Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, where the scripture says, do not remember the former things nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So when we began our fellowship 41 years ago, I chose to give that particular Bible study on that, uh, on that day because God was doing a new thing. And we began our fellowship in a house in Ontario that ultimately my, my parents bought. My sister-in-law, Patty, who was the first person who ever answered a, a, an invitation, an open invitation that I gave, she, she, uh, she actually came forward at an invitation I gave it, a, an outreach. And, uh, and so, you know, to make sure she stayed with God because she's so rebellious, we started a church in her house so I could keep an eye on her. Just kidding. I don't care about her. No, we, but anyway, so we did that, and um, our fellowship began in that way. And the very first Bible study I gave was out of Isaiah 43, 18, and 19, just to say that the Lord is going to do a new work, which he has done over 41 years. I thank God for the work that he's done, and we had what I called, and I, we have them up here to remind you, and we have them in the uh, foyer that you can see we're painting right now to brighten up, but uh, the, we call them the pillars of our ministry, the word and worship, witness and witness. We, we believe that uh, the word of God should be uh, front and center. Everything we do in terms of our, our entire ministry is to be built on God's word. And so when you're in the word of God, you learn how to worship in spirit and in truth. And when that takes place, then you have a community, uh, something we call a witness. You, you actually realize that the first thing God ever said is not good is for the man to be alone. And so God created a community so that we could have fellowship with one another and like-minded individuals. And then we should take what God has done and we should take it to others. And that's where the witness came in. And so the word and worship, witness and witness have been the pillars that this church has been built on, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And so over 41 years, we've uh, been faithful, I would believe, to, to hold fast to teaching the word and our desire to to walk in his spirit. And so that's, that's what the Lord has done over the years with us. And so I'm celebrating the reality of that. Though uh, my pastor taught us a long time ago, he said, I, uh, I take my hat off to the past, but I take my jacket off for the future. And so we're just beginning. Now it was said in the first service, you know, 41 more years, no, that, that, no, you wouldn't want a 130 year old pastor. Um, I don't think you would, John might. Uh, but I don't think that either. Um, I, I, I just believe that God has called us to, to continue until he raises up somebody whom he will, should the Lord tarry, to pick up and move on, move forward, and, and to take our fellowship to where God would have it in the future. But until that point, um, I'm just rejoicing and, and blessed to be able to say that, that I've been here with my, my precious, my wife, for 41 years, and we've seen God do marvelous things but I know that he has much more to do in the future. So praise God for that. And uh, I'm blessed by that. We were gone. My wife and I, I was in New Mexico. Some of you may have noticed I was gone. I was in New Mexico for a while. I did, uh, I met with some pastors, did a, did a church service and all in, uh, in uh, uh, New Mexico. Then this last week, my, my daughter Corinne asked us if we wanted to, uh, to go on vacation. We haven't had, va Marie and I don't take vacation, so I thought that would be nice. And so we went to Florida, and uh, interesting, in, uh, you know, where, where we went, it, and they got a, a nice little place in some community, uh, Panama City, and some of you are probably familiar with it. And so we went there, and it, it was a nice little resort type thing, and, and so Marie and I decided to take a walk. I don't know if I should tell you this, but I think it's funny, so I will. So Marie and I decided to take a walk, and we went down 
the street to get a Starbucks and in Starbucks and we we had like three coffees and we got turned around. I mean, we're two old people and two old people in a strange neighborhood. We made new friends. And as we were, we were walking, you know, together, um, we, <laughs> we, we were going in the wrong direction. So I called my son-in-law and he said, come and find us. And so, so he said, you're way out of the way. And I said, yeah, so are you. You get right with God and I'll find my way back <laughs> to your place. And so... So we were standing on the street going, I hope you understand this. This made me laugh. I hope it makes you laugh too. I saw humor in it. But I'm standing there holding, you know, three coffees. And some guy walks up. And he's a real well-dressed guy because it's a nice place. He's really well-dressed. And I'm in jeans and a T-shirt, you know. And Marie's standing next to me. And he walks up and he has money in his hand. And he says, are you selling coffee? So I, I, I said, no, 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 we're just lost. And, and he goes, oh, wait. And I, and I look at his hand. He's got dollar bills and things. And I'm thinking, and I think, no, and I'm just, so he starts to walk away. He's kind of embarrassed for some reason. So I said, no, the, the Starbucks is over here. And I'm pointing to him, but he said, yeah, yeah. And he's walking and it didn't hit me. They, I, they, okay, here we go. This, I thought this was funny. But I said, Marie, he sees a Mexican. He thinks we're standing on a street corner selling coffee. Yeah, I wanted to wash his windows. I mean, it just was, it was funny. It busted me up. And, I, 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 you know, we cried. We've been laughing for days over that. It, it was hilarious. But anyway, we were flying home on, on, on Friday. It's only an hour and a half from Panama City to Dallas, and from Dallas, two and a half hours here. But what happened is they had a weather problem of some sort. They diverted us to, to, to a place out there about 40 minutes outside of Dallas. By the time we came in, uh, it was um, too late. The plane had left. And so what they did with us, and it was around, uh, I think, around 4, 5, 6, I forget what time it was. They had to stand in line. Some of you have done this. I've never had to do exactly this. The line we stood in stretched out a half mile to at least maybe a mile. I mean, it's not an exaggeration. I took a picture. It was stretching back. Marie and I were in line for four and a half to five hours. Four and a half to five hours, just kind of standing there. And so there was a guy in front of me. His name was Daniel. You know, we became best friends. We were there for a long time. And, uh, but he, he, he was sharing with me for four and a half hours. And he, he, was, he was accompanying four little girls from Guatemala. And his job was to take the little girls and he was going to take them to a safe, safe place, a location in uh, South Carolina. And that's what he does for a living. He began to share with me some things for, like I said, four and a half hours about, he said, what is actually taking place? What's going on? Uh, he's an ex-police officer, a police detective. Uh, he was uh, on the force 20 years in three different departments. You know, he knew what he was talking about. And so we had an interesting conversation uh, well, actually, I let him talk, and he talked and talked and talked. Real good guy. Really enjoyed him. And had a, he's from McAllen, McAllen, Texas. He says this is really one of the, the areas where a lot of uh, action is taking place. And he was sharing things. And I'll give you one thing, and then I'm going to get into the Word. But he, he, I found this interesting. He said, you know, he said, the people that are coming across right now, he said, we're having to stop. He, he said, we are stopping them. He said, and we're having conversation with them. But he said, you, you can't imagine the amount of people we have to ship back. We're shipping back. He says, and it, the reason is, is because they will, we question them. We talk to them. They have to have interviews. He says, and then they get mad. We have to put guards on, on buses to take them back to the air, uh, air, air um, to, to take an airplane to fly them back to the country. He said, because... They have come with this belief that all you need to do, he said, is cross over and you're now going to be here. He said, where in fact, he said, that's not absolutely true. He says, so they actually start starting fights and stuff. He says, you don't see it on the, on the news. He says, but they're fighting. We've had to put guards on, on buses because a lot of the men are just young men who just are coming here for, quote, unquote, a better life. He says, and it's creating a problem because they're saying we were promised that we're going to be able to be taken care of and this and that. He said, and that's what's taking place right now. He says, it's really a bad thing 
that's taking place. He said that a lot of people aren't aware of is that they're coming. He said, he said, I've talked to guys, one man in particular coming out of Guatemala, he said, who sold his house and gave it to the, uh, to the guy who was going to bring him across, gave him the proceeds from his house and saved just a little bit so he could come. He said, believing that uh, our president has opened the borders so everybody can just come if they want. He says, when they don't qualify because they're not leaving terrorism, they're not leaving danger, they're not leaving any of that, they just want a new life. He says, they're being turned back. He says, and they sold their home. They have nothing to go back to. He says, this is just a real bad situation. I'm telling you this because we need to be in prayer. We need to pray that God will give to to, to all who are involved in whatever decisions are being made, to take into consideration all the pain and the sorrow and the hurt that many are going through right now and attempting to find a new life here and believing in false promises that are being given to them because there, a lot are being turned away at that border. They're coming across and they're being stopped. And he said not only that, but he said there have been terrorists that we know. They're on the watch list. He says there have been drug runners, the fentanyl that's coming in, and many are dying. He says it's because what they're doing, I could go on, I should not, but four and a half hours. But he said, uh, <laughs> he goes, you know, he goes, he says, he says they'll, they'll put children over here to draw attention, and then they go through a different path, and they bring people in. He said they're bringing in um, uh, fentanyl. He says it's, it's killing Americans. He says they're bringing in um, children that are being trafficked. He said it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing that's taking place. And so we, we were talking for a long time. We really need to, to pray that God will give, uh, give us uh, people who understand that, that God will bring in a government that that understands uh, what law really is, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going into a, a speech about that, but it really touched my heart. And we were there, we were there for four and a half hours. I was talking to him, uh, and uh, it, it just, it's pretty tough, guys. As a matter of fact, you know, the four little girls we saw are so precious. I mean, the precious babies. I mean, who, who doesn't have a heart for children, right? Let me pray for them. I, I just thought of it. Father, I do lift up these babies. Lord, the stories this, this man was telling me, uh, I, I, I lift these babies to you, and, and, and so much is going on. God, I don't have the answer. I know you do. I ask that you would put people in place who would be able to do, to do what is right and to protect this nation, Lord, from the things that are taking place, but also, Lord, to, to, to have the compassion to know how to care for those that have a need for care. Lord, I, I don't have that wisdom, but but you do. And I pray that you would place people in position that can sort that all out in a way that is right and it brings honor to you. So, Father, I just lift my new friend Daniel to you and, and I ask that you would be with him as he goes about this hard job and so many others who are doing it. We lift our nation. We lift this all to you now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Oh, anyway, so many other things. Better get in the word. Um, where are we? Okay. Mark chapter, what is it? 12. All right. Just testing you. We're going to look at verses 18 through uh, 27. Let's begin reading together at verse 18. Mark chapter 12. Then some Sadducee, Sadducees, who say there's no resurrection, came to him. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind leaves no children. His brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying, left no offspring. Second took her. He died, nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, Whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly 
mistaken. So what we're going to do is what I normally do. I'm going to bring you up to speed on what's taking place here in Mark chapter 12 by reminding you of a few things that we've already looked at, laying a context and then moving into our study. We're looking today at the God of life. That's what we're looking at. So in this chapter, Jesus is asked several questions. In verses 13 through 17, we already saw it. Those verses contained a, a question concerning paying taxes to Caesar. Verse 28 begins with a question con concerning the greatest commandment. In the verses before us, we have a question concerning resurrection. Now the Pharisees, as we've been reading through Mark, the Pharisees have recognized that Jesus is a threat. He's a threat to their power. He's a threat to their positions. He poses such a great threat that they've increased their attacks on him. You see, early in his ministry, the religious opposition began to question him. From the beginning, he had been teaching with authority. And as he did so, his fame had grown throughout the land. When we began our study in Mark chapter 1, we saw how he had taught in a synagogue on the Sabbath. And the people were listening to him, and as they did so, they marveled at his teaching. In Mark 1.22, it says they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Mark tells us that Jesus cast a demon out of a, a man attending synagogue. Again, the people were amazed. They began to talk among themselves. Mark 1.27 says they're amazed. They asked, and, and they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For he said, for they said, with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And in verse 28 of Mark chapter 1, immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So his popularity grew, and it had caught, he had caught the attention of the religious group called Pharisees. You see, his teachings had undercut their traditions. His miracles were drawing multitudes. In Mark 1, 32 and 33, those verses tell us that they brought all the sick and demon-possessed to him, and the whole city was gathered together at the door of Peter's home. So he healed. He healed people of various diseases. And as he was doing so and speaking and all, people were being drawn to him. When we look at Matthew 11, uh, in that passage, uh, John sent two of his men to ask Jesus a question. Are you the Messiah? Are you the coming one, or do we look for another, is what they asked him. In Matthew 11, verse 5, Jesus replied, The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. You see, when John was having his doubts about who Jesus was, to the degree that he sent his men to ask him, are you the coming one? The term coming one is another way of speaking of Messiah. Are you Messiah is what they were asking. Are you the coming one or are we to look for another? The immediate response that was going to solve the doubt problems that John had was Jesus quoted to them passages out of Isaiah in the scriptures in order that they would see that their doubt is going to be dealt with by the scripture itself. And so his answer was solidly grounded on scripture because Scripture is always the solution to doubt. Like it says in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. So his popularity has increased, but as it has, so has the attack. The religious leaders saw him as a threat. They began to plot to eliminate Jesus Christ. In Mark 3, verse 6, it says, the Pharisees went out and began plotting with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Now, Jesus was a teacher with great authority. And because he was, religious leaders began to ask him questions. If you're a teacher, I'll ask you questions. And that's what they've been doing. But the questions weren't sincere. They were designed to entrap him. Mark 12, 13 says they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. In other words, they're trying to provoke him to give an answer that can use as a charge to bring to the Roman government. They knew that if they could get him to say something about the Roman government, that they could charge him with sedition, under, overthrowing the, the rule of, of the Romans. And, and so Luke 20, verse 20 says, they watched him closely. They sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They were hoping to catch him in his words in order to hand him over to the rule and authority of the governor. Well, they had asked the question of Jesus, is it lawful to give, uh, you know, this tribute? 
Is it proper for us to do that? Do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And so the question had been posed by disciples of Pharisees as well as Herodians. And Jesus gave the answer, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. And, and they, they were amazed at his response. And Luke 20 verse 26 says they were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. Matthew 22 verse 22 adds, when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So the wisdom of his response silenced them and they left him. Job 5 verse 12 says it like this. He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. Well, the Pharisees are not the only ones that are wanting to argue with the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not the only ones. There's another group. And what's happening is they're beginning to line up, if you will, in opposition to him. The, the attacks are beginning to be continuous. Now, remember with me that this is the last week of the life of Christ. And so more of this is taking place as we look at it. They're coming in waves. So we begin at verse 18 and notice how it says, some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him and they asked him saying, teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind, leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. So they come and they have a supposed spiritual question. These are the Sadducees. Now notice verse 18, some of the Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him. Now, this was the same day, according to Matthew 22, 23, because Matthew said the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him. So the Herodians and Pharisees had failed in their attempt to entrap him, but that didn't stop the Sadducees from trying. You read your Bible and you see Sadducee. What is a Sadducee? Well, the Sadducees were called the aristocrats of Judaism. They were wealthy. And greatly resented. They were largely in control of temple concessions. And that's how they obtained most of their wealth. And so when Jesus cleansed out the temple, he enraged those Sadducees. A second thing about them is they were pro-Roman. They obtained their influence from Rome. They helped Rome to control the people with the use of their own police force. They had what was called the temple guard. We'll see that later on when the temple guard came uh, to arrest Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But they also had an extremely rigid interpretation of Scripture. You see, they believed that the law of Moses alone was to be followed, and they gave primacy to the first five books of the Bible and ignored the rest. You see, unlike Pharisees, they completely rejected the oral and written traditions pertaining to Scripture. They prided themselves as the preservers of true faith. So they ignored the scriptures. They ignored everything except the first five books. They were influenced by Greek thinkers. They were religious liberals, as we would call them today. In Acts 23, verse 8, it says that the Sadducees say there's no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. And so you had a contrast between Sadducees and Pharisees. And so Jesus had just cleansed the temple. He had driven them out during the time of Passover at what would be called peak season. And that had gained their attention. It stirred them to opposition. So they approach him again. Notice this. They, they begin verse 18, verse 19, and they say, Teacher, Moses wrote to us. So they began with flattery. And, and as they're speaking uh, to him, they're referring to him as, as a great teacher. But notice how they began by appealing to Moses. Now, Moses is the supreme spokesman for God. And they asked the question, if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up children unto his brother. So what they're appealing to is found in the law of Moses. It's called the law of leveret marriage. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, in chapter 25, verses 5 and 6, it says, If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So that would keep the tribal names and families and the inheritance intact. 
So if a man died without a son, his brother was to marry his brother's widow. The firstborn son would be recognized as the son of the dead brother. And so that's the question they're bringing. And they go on in verse, uh, verse 20 and read to verse 23. The first took a wife, dying. He left no offspring. The second took her. He died, didn't leave any offspring. The third, likewise, seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. And the eighth brother was happy. No, I'm just... <laughs> Just seeing if you were listening. <laughs> Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife shall, will she be? All seven had her as wife. So they brought this question. It's a common question that they would use at that time to confuse Pharisees in argument. You see, if all eight appear in the resurrection in exactly the same condition and circumstances in which they died, well, how could their marriage relationship possibly be reconciled? But I want you to see this. Notice verse 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? We'll spend a few moments on this. Are you not therefore mistaken? That word mistaken, for those of you who take notes, it simply means to go astray. It speaks of wandering off. It also lends itself to the word deceived. He's saying you are deceived. You have wandered from the true course. You're dead wrong. That's what he's saying. Now, how had they ended up dead wrong? Well, one, he says, you've wandered off because you don't know the scriptures. They wandered off because they were ignorant of the testimony of the Bible. He points out that their rejection of the rest of scripture has led them to error. You see, when you read your Bibles, we have 66 books in the Bible. The Old Testament contains 39. The New Testament, 27. The Old Testament has the law, the prophets, and the writings. But the Sadducees only regarded the first five books. They rejected the other books. And in doing so, they were rejecting the whole counsel of God. What they were doing was ignoring testimony of Scripture, and that caused them to wander into error. Psalm 119, 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. Every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. They're ignoring the testimony of scripture, wandering into error. You see, God's word gave hope for resurrection. In Job 19, verses 25 through 27, Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, that in the end he'll stand upon the earth after my skin has been destroyed. Yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Psalm 17, verse 15, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Psalm 49, 15, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. Isaiah 26, 19, your dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise? Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Daniel 12, 2 and 3, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Not only does the Old Testament point to reg toward res uh, resurrection, but Jesus also taught the resurrection. John 5, 28 and 29. Don't marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear the voice, his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. John eleven twenty three 23 through 25, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Later, Paul would give insight in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. He said, the body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body. 
there's a spiritual body. So you don't know the scriptures is what he's saying. But you also are ignoring God's power, which makes resurrection possible. Jeremiah 32, 17. Now, Lord God, behold, you have made the heaven and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. In Luke 1, 37, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Acts 26, 8. Paul said, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? You see, the fact that there is a resurrection is to be established forever, very soon, because Jesus himself is about to be raised from the dead. In Romans 1, 4, the scripture says, Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. See, up to that point, Jesus was looked at as a good man. He was looked at as a prophet. He was looked at as being a great teacher. But if he, who had stated that he would be raised on the third day, if he remained in the grave, He'd have been a liar. And if he was a liar, then he couldn't be a good man, teacher, or a prophet. And so everything about Christ's ministry is centered on the resurrection. Somebody wrote Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. Well, they didn't know the scripture, neither do they know the power of God. And he says in verse uh, 25, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So what he's doing here is he's explaining how they've misunderstood God's word and power. Now notice he makes mention of angels. The Sadducees deny that there are angels. So he mentions that right away. But he speaks of them right when they rise from the dead. Now, Luke gives us more insight in Luke 20. In Luke 20, verses 34 through 36, Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. Those who are considered worthy of taking part in, in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. And so let's look at this briefly. Marriage is ordained by God but it's only intended for our time on earth. God established marriage and intended it to produce godly offspring. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air or the sky and every other living creature that moves on the ground. So in heaven, there's no birth necessary because there's no death in heaven. Now, I want you to note something. Jesus says those who enter heaven are like the angels. He did not say that they become angels, but are like angels. Why am I pointing that out? Because every once in a while, I read it on social media that somebody's friend died and they're, they're now angels. No, they're not. I've seen angels. I had an uncle named Angel. <laughs> I don't know why I went there. I'm just... No, the Bible makes it very clear, and let me point this out. Those who enter into heaven are greater than angels. Why would you want to be less than? Those who enter into heaven are greater. Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? We don't become angels. I'm saying that because some mistakenly, unfortunately, have come to believe that. They even post those things. No, we are greater than them. They actually minister to us because we are children of God. We're not angels. We're greater in that position. And so Jesus says they'll be like angels. Well, in what way? Well, we won't increase in numbers. We are spiritual in nature and we're eternal. You see, you cannot be born in heaven. You have to be born again while on earth. In John 3, verse 3, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. The way to enter into the kingdom of God is to be born again. 
but there is no continuation of, of uh, children through birth in heaven. But he goes on, verse 26, concerning the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. So he points that the resurrection is found in Moses' writings. Remember, they only held fast to the first five books. The first five books of the Bible were written by Moses. So he quotes out of Exodus, one of the books Moses wrote. And he points to when God revealed himself to Moses. And when he did so, he identified himself. Exodus 3, verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Exodus 3, 15, God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Notice God said, I am the God of Abraham, not I was the God of Abraham. Though they were long dead, he was still their God every bit as much as when they were physically alive. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. According to Luke 20, 38, for to him all are alive. So Jesus is the living bread. He gives life to all who trust in him. In John 6, 50, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. In John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then the question is asked, do you believe this? He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. One of these days, should the Lord come in a time when, when I'm already past, my own pastor said something like this, and D.L. Moody said something like this. D.L. Moody said, one day you'll read that D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't believe it, because at that, at that time, I'll be more alive than I ever was before. See, of all people, believers do not fear death. Now, that doesn't mean we go out there trying to figure out how we're going to die. You know, I'm not running out there jumping in front of diesels. You know, it's, it's, I'm not going to do that. That's tempting the Lord. That's called presumption. But until the moment comes that the Lord is determined, is my time to see him face to face? I'm indestructible. I'm invulnerable. I will continue to live, and so will you. And when, if you're a believer, and when you, when you close your eyes here, you instantly are in the presence of the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. So I have no fear of death. Now, I'm not, I, you know, I, I have my ways I prefer going. You know, let's face it, all of us would say, well, I just as soon, and I've got my list that God's aware of. <laughs> I've mentioned to him more than once. But the day's going to come, whatever it may be, and there's nothing I can do because it's appointed for me to die. So what is my job right now is to simply live because the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so I live each day as if I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord physically, but I already know I'm in his presence now as I am, right? So that doesn't mean that when somebody I love passes on that it doesn't cause my heart to grieve. Can you imagine how many friends over the years who were very dear to my wife and me, how many of them have passed on into eternity? How many, how many, how many funerals we have attended or, or have presided over? How many people in our fellowship some of you wouldn't know this, but, but the average of funerals that we do as a church is something like 50 a year. And so there are quite a number of people who go into glory. And, and yeah, sometimes you carry, as a matter of fact, you always carry a grief in your heart, a sorrow in your heart, because you miss them, you love them, you, you didn't want them to move on. You, you wanted them longer. You wanted to be with them. All of us normally are that way. 
normally. But, but when the day comes when David Rosales is no longer here, that's only because I'm there. So I have no fear of death because my life is in the hand of Jesus Christ. And that comes through scripture. So I have a faith in Christ because if I'm born again, Jesus said, I will not die. I just move residences. I move from here and I go to a greater, a more beautiful place where people aren't walking up asking if I'm selling coffee. I go to a beautiful place to be with the Lord. Now that's a beautiful thing. And the Sadducees did not know that. So they want to argue with Christ. You do therefore greatly err. You are sadly mistaken, terribly mistaken. This isn't just a minor, minor error. This is a terrible error. You have no hope for the future. But if you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you have a hope now and you have a hope forever because we will go to be with him and forever be with him in the Lord. And in that we rejoice. You see, that's why resurrection, Jesus, amen. Jesus is going to demonstrate what power over death is when he's resurrected from the dead. When all the people who loved him and knew him, and even some of his ministers, his apostles, and some of the ladies, when they were all thinking he's just gone for good. The only one who was there at, that, at, that, uh, at the cross was John and, and some of the ladies, and they were there. And then three days later, they go back, and we know the story. They go to, to finish his burial and to give him a better burial because they were hasty in doing so. And then they're asked, what are you doing here? Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? And so one of these days, we'll all, oh, should the Lord tarry, one of these days, someone's going to say some words about us. Hopefully they're good words. They're going to speak about us. And uh, I want to live in such a way that when my, my sons and my daughters, should they desire to uh, speak of their father, I don't want to live in a way that they're going to have to make up things about me because I wasn't what you guys thought I, 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 I was all along. No, I live in such a way, not in front of you. I live that way in front of them. So that in the day comes when they speak of their father, they will say, this is the man who loved Christ. That's what I want. But one of these days, and it's, who knows, I'm getting older. Next month's my birthday again. We. Um, we're getting old. And you know what? With age comes interesting getting lost in places <laughs> with coffee. But I have not erred in one thing. I have sought the power of God. And I've sought his word. And in his word and through his power, I have something these Sadducees didn't have. I have hope. I have hope. You close your eyes here and you open them there. And you see the face of your Savior. And you see guys like, like Paul and the Apostle Peter and James and John and Bartholomew and all these people you've read about, you see them face to face and, and then you look around and, and there's grandma and there's, there's dad and there's mama, there's my friends that I, I've been missing so long. There they are. And it's a reunion and it's a joy. That's what we have to look forward to. Not just a body in a grave that decomposes. But we have a spirit that goes to be with the Lord because he purchased it with his blood. He owns it and then he claims it and we'll be with him forever. What is a greater hope than that? What is a greater hope than to be with the Lord forever and ever? And Sadducees, you deny it because you don't know scripture. Sadducee, you deny it because you don't know the power of God. He says again, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, and you therefore are greatly mistaken. According to Luke 20, 39 and 40, some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher, and no one dared to ask him any more questions. They got mastered by the master. If you have a question to ask the Lord, be ready for his answer. Where is his answer going to come from? His word. Spend time in the word. Spend time reading the word. Spend time being taught the word. 
and spend time giving the word. If you're a parent, give the word to your children. If you're a grandparent, live the word before your children. If you're a single person with nobody other than parents, we'll say, live in such a way that your parents know that your faith is real. Because the way you live and your parents are watching you, that can make all the difference in the world. That's how my, my dad and mom got saved, by just noticing me that I had changed. Because the power of God transforms lives. And God's word gives us hope for the future. Live for Jesus. Our Father, we ask that you would work in us.